everyone. <laughs> well, but you look gorgeous, so there you go. That's why you bought. Thank you. Damn Gosh. it. Yeah, even though I can't walk in it at all, but. Jillian and I were just kind of talking backstage a little bit about this thing called the fetishize, I can't ever pronounce it, fetishization of motherhood and how it is the be-all, end-all and pregnancy is a gift and you can't ever be bored or feel sick or like want your kid to sleep an hour longer so you don't have to deal with them in the morning. Um, and your book speaks to that. To a certain extent. I think like your book is like the real version of these other parenting books that we see? Well, it's not so much a parenting book. It's a pregnancy book. Um, and it, it's conception, pun intended, or inception, came from uh, my partner Heidi's pregnancy with our son and how truly horrified I was on a daily <laughs> basis. I mean, really, really shocked and disappointed in so many different instances at how either outdated or corrupted mainstream sources of information were by big food and big pharma. Because, you know, if it's a big book, it's got a big website, and it's got a big magazine, it gets advertising from, you know, various companies, and people don't want to say, oh, don't do this, this is really bad, because it can hurt the bottom line. So to make a long story short, uh, I decided to write this book with a team of doctors, and it took five and a half years, but here it is. And it does definitely take on the attitude of like, listen, you know what? You may hate this, and that's okay. Or you may feel uncomfortable, you may feel out of control, you may love it, and that's okay too. But we need to create an environment for women where it's judgment-free. And you can talk openly. Absolutely, so important. Now, what was your kind of aha moment when Heidi was pregnant and you were like, this isn't, this bookstore thing is not, I can't find anything. Well, there were three moments um, where I kind of had these epiphanies. Um, the first one was obviously we're a same-sex couple, so she needed to go get inseminated. And our doctor said, oh, you need to go to a fertility clinic to do that, which was not true. And we go to the fertility clinic, and I'm like, well, just get the turkey baster and put the stuff in there, and let's get this show on the road. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we need to run all these tests, and we need to check this, and we need to check that and her thyroid, and her vitamin D, and her iron, and her uterine lining, and her cervical mucus. Sorry if I have to hear it, so do you. And hopefully you will at one point when you're trying to get pregnant. As opposed to just like people who get drunk and have a one night stand. Right, but here's what's interesting. That was actually really informative because we ended up discovering that she had uterine polyps that needed to be removed and she had a thyroid condition, which can be very serious when you're pregnant. And in that moment, I was like, wait, how, wait, hold on. What if we were a heterosexual couple, had a couple of drinks, bing, bang, boom, she's pregnant, then what? Oh, well, we would have just had to figure out how to deal with it while she was pregnant. And I remember thinking, how has nobody had this discussion with us? How come nobody has this discussion with my heterosexual friends? Why hasn't anybody prepared us for this kind of dialogue or conversation? So now we're at this clinic, and she's not infertile, and they start pushing all these drugs on her. Oh, she needs Clomid. I'm like, for what? For eggs. I'm like, I just can see the eggs. You pulled the eggs up. She's got enough eggs. There's utery A and utery... utery uh, Ovary, <laughs> forgive me, a little tired. Ovary A, ovary B, there's You're doing great, I feel you. Thanks, buddy. So to make a long story short, they tried to put three separate fertility drugs on her. She wasn't infertile. So I'm like, okay, no, we're not, we're not doing that. So she gets pregnant. Then they go to give her a vitamin, a prenatal vitamin. Number one fertility clinic on the West Coast. So being neurotic, I, of course, look at the ingredients in the vitamin. And it has red number 40, hydrogenated oil, which is trans fat, a preservative called propylene glycol, which is extremely toxic, and I just lost my mind. And I was like, I, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is it that she needs? Folic acid, iron, right? I, what we all sort of know at this point, but I said, you realize you're giving my pregnant wife with my unborn child a pill of poison. Are you serious? And at that point, I was like, this is insane. This is madness. I went, I got the number one book in the space. And in that book, it's like, oh, if you want to have chlorinated sugar, which just passes right through the body, an artificial sweetener, the FDA says it's groovy. And 
<laughs> I was like, that's it. I'm writing this book. I don't care. And here we are. And I have to say, without naming names, the number one book in the space, we all know what it is. It's also incredibly, at least it was for me, panic inducing. I mean, you could look up like, oh, my foot hurts. And it's like, <laughs> it will go anywhere from you have a foot cramp to amputation. Am I right? <laughs> I think it has been updated a little bit, but yeah, I, I have heard that the, in, in some of these cases, there's a lot of fear mongering. Um, <clears throat> and we really try not to do that with this book. It can be a little overwhelming because there, there is a lot of information and there are a lot of statistics. And the truth of the matter is that childhood cancers are on the rise, that learning disabilities and autism, these things are on the rise, allergies, autoimmune diseases. And we have to ask ourselves why. And I promise you it's not caffeine, alcohol, or soft cheese. That's not the problem. And so, you know, you want to make people aware and you want to give them the information. You want to do it in a supportive and empowering way and let them know that it, it will be okay. But some of it, some of it can be a little overwhelming. And so we really try to, to do it in a very supportive, friendly, and accessible way. What surprised you the most, having written this book? Seriously, about pregnancy, like what did you look back on thinking, I had no damn idea? Gosh, well, in truth, because my partner is the one who went through it. But you guys went through it together. We did, and if I, if I could go back now and really say, God, I wish I knew, I wish I knew, because I do know so much about the health stuff, so I was lucky to be able to catch a lot of those red flags, but she definitely was suffering with postpartum and I didn't, I didn't understand it. And it doesn't always look the way you think it will. She just was zombified and I thought, well, she's tired or she had a C-section and so she's in pain or I didn't understand what she was going through and it was kind of scary and kind of frustrating because it went on for about three months and I was like, she's a zombie, she's gone, she's dead to me, she's, she's, there's nobody home. And had I known more about what was going on and how postpartum can look and the varying degrees of it and why it's happening, I really think that I could have been more supportive and I could have helped her out more. Um, and it's, it's a very scary thing, postpartum, and you can do many things to mitigate it with regard to nutrition and exercise. And you know, I'm sure you've heard the typical, more well-known stuff like omega-3s and so on. But it can, it can definitely take many different forms, and uh, there are many different levels of it, and I just think we need to be very understanding and very supportive when women go through this. How did you get the medical team together for this book? Great question. Um, let's take them one step at a time. The endocrinologist is actually our family internist and endocrinologist, and I have been working with uh, Dr. Van Hurley for... Wow, before the 2010, so about seven years now, and I adore her. She is brilliant. Um, and Heidi, when we discovered that she had a thyroid problem, it was Dr. Van Hurley who helped get everything regulated and under control. And I thought, I don't understand why endocrinology is not taking a bigger role here. This is critical. We're talking about fertility and infertility. How many women are infertile? How many men and why? And so Dr. V was an obvious one. Then we didn't have many great experiences with our OBGYN. And through me coming to this place and the pediatrician that we had initially, uh, of feeling like, wait a second, you know, why... Why are we at this fertility clinic when another OBGYN said, oh, we could have done that in our office? It's like, oh, they're trading patients, giving referrals. And there were a host of things that I found a bit suspect. So, like, they give you this drink. Um, it's this gross, disgusting, orange, sugary drink to test for gestational diabetes, which, of course, is loaded with chemicals. And I said, well, okay, what's the goal? Oh, we need this much sugar. And I was like, can I just give her two cups of orange juice? Oh, no, she needs to drink this. So I called Dr. Van Hurley. I go, what can I give her? And she goes, give her two cups of orange juice. She doesn't need to drink that. So I began asking around after the book was done and after I had left our pediatrician for a host of reasons, found Dr. Gordon, who is now our pediatrician, and Dr. Gordon, when I asked him to participate on the book, he said, you need Dr. Suzanne Gilberg-Lenz. So I went and I met with her and I met with several OBGYNs and 
she has a really good integration of holistic, Western, Eastern, homeopathic, Ayurvedic. She's a certified yoga teacher. And I, I wanted doctors that can look at people as a whole, not treating disease. And we call them upstreamists. And that means there's an analogy. People are drowning in the water. Doctors run in, they get them out of the water, and they start giving them CPR to save lives, and that's great. But the upstreamist starts swimming upstream, and we say, where are you going? Well, I'm trying to figure out who's throwing the bodies in the water. So they're looking for the origin of the bigger issues, and that's what these three doctors are. As opposed to just writing a prescription for everything. Oh, you're getting, you know... It, yeah, exactly, it, exactly. They look at the root of the problem and how to handle it as naturally and holistically as possible. What about the tone? I love the tone of this book. And that's what I was referring to in my first question, is that the tone is so, it's, it's just like two friends going out for drinks, assuming you're not pregnant, of course. <laughs> and just talking about what it means to be pregnant. It's very honest. I think that honesty is really important. Um, it is friendly and it draws upon my experiences uh, with Heidi and there are anecdotes at every stage and Heidi actually contributes to the book as well from her perspective and how annoying I was to her, which is <laughs> kind of amusing. Um, but it is kind of like a girlfriend's guide and then it's also sort of very informative and it's, it's not the most forgiving. Um, and I say, like, listen, this is not the time to eat for two. And the person that tells you, it's okay, it's okay, you're pregnant, is doing you a massive disservice. And your child, a massive disservice. It's a judgment-free zone. But this is what you should know about the choices that are in front of you. So, like, with eating your placenta. Uh, okay. I mean... Really? And so many people want to be politically correct. It's not, it's not safe. It's not safe. And so we think, oh, it's, you know, the Kardashians were doing it. And <laughs> this is, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever to suggest that eating your placenta will fight postpartum or boost your breast milk. Con con conversely, we've seen many different foods do such a thing, but not eating your placenta. So your placenta is quite literally a decaying organ. And... We also know that its job is to block the baby from toxins. So when we've done studies on the placenta after birth, they found heavy metal, they found over 200 different kinds of toxins in the umbilical cord. I, you're gonna eat that again? No, 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 no. Let's get back, let's get back to eating for two, because okay. that is, I think of all my girlfriends who get pregnant, that's the thing you're most excited about, is that finally they can just let it, let it rip, basically. <laughs> I know. And I did have a client once say to me, she's like, my entire life, you know, society, the media, it's like fit, 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 skinny, 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 which has become a dirty word, and, and to a certain extent, rightfully so. But she's like, now I'm pregnant, and it's like, oh, take a load off, oh, sit down, oh, eat for two, no, you have a baby, no, I have another piece of pie. And she's like, this is the first time in my life I've been given permission to eat, and you're trying to take that from me. And I was like, I'm not trying to take it from you. But it's 80,000 calories to make a baby. That's not that much. It's 300 calories a day. That's it? Pretty much, yeah. In the last trimester, it's like 450 yeah. extra a day. It's, it's not that much. And if you think about it, I'm eating for two. Well, I mean, the baby is the size of a freaking poppy seed and then, you know, a tiny shrimp. And then uh, the biggest the child may get in your stomach is 11-ish pounds. And that's a very, very large baby. So gaining a lot of weight during pregnancy is not only very unhealthy for mommy, but it's also very unhealthy for baby. With that said, I've taken a ton of weight off of many women who've gained 80 pounds or more, right? It happens. As I said, it's a judgment-free zone. We can get the weight off. It just might make labor a little more difficult, bouncing back a little more difficult, postpartum potentially a little bit worse. And so we want to give women the tools. But the great news here, beyond all the scary, hey, 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 watch out, watch out, watch out, is that we're starting to learn the most amazing things about pregnancy. And in fact, when you manage your pregnancy with relatively clean eating and a relatively active lifestyle, the baby can lend mommy embryonic stem cells 
and is essentially a fountain of youth for mommy. So we're starting to see women coming out of maternity more athletic than at any point in their entire lives. It's amazing. It's fascinating stuff. Before we go to the audience, what's the biggest pregnancy myth that you learned or that you wanted to debunk? God, there are so many. Where to begin? Um, here, uh, it's not necessarily a myth, but I've seen extremes, right? So many years ago, women were fragile. And, you know, we needed to be so careful and, and, and lay down and take it easy. Now, we're seeing the flip side of that. The pendulum has swung. And on Instagram, we've got women, you know, squatting 300 pounds and then dropping out the baby. Or they're like, I ran the marathon. <laughs> you know, they cross the finish line of the marathon, the New York marathon, and then they go to the ER and they deliver the kid. And, you know, they're like, look at me. I am a woman. Hear me roar. This is possible. And while it may be possible, it's not entirely safe. And it's not the smartest time to go about proving a point. And so the answer with everything is generally right in the middle. Use your common sense. Yes. Yes. I had yes. the best doctor ever. Her advice to me was don't eat sushi from a gas station and don't ride roller coasters and you'll be fine. Talk about all that in the book. Exactly. We'd be in Japan. Heidi was pregnant and there were pregnant women bellying up to the sushi bar. We were in Italy and there was a pregnant person with an espresso. We were in France and there they are eating the raw cheese. And drinking come back, wine. Come back to America and they're drinking diet soda, which you would never see in any of those countries. It's very interesting. Very, yeah. yeah. And it's all about who pays for what. Bingo. To our audience, please. Hi, Julian. Hi. Um, I have a question. Like, what do you suggest people to know about um, fundamental knowledge of nutrition that can like help help way help way uh, help people live in a better life, like healthier life? Of course, I take a very middle of the road approach to nutrition because. Anything that's too extreme is going to be inaccessible in the long run, in my opinion. Um, however, we'll touch upon that. These are the two golden rules. Number one, I don't care what anyone tells you, weight loss is calories in, calories out. Period. End of story. So we can get into food quality and what have you, but this is the golden rule. And Food has calories. Calories are units of energy. Energy that doesn't get burned gets stored as fat, and fat is first and foremost stored energy. So if we don't overeat, we won't store this energy as fat. And I have seen a million people say, oh, not on these kinds of foods. And I like to take a bear, for example. Like a bear, a bear is paleo for the most part, no? And yet they put on a ton of weight and hibernate for the winter. So the reality is, it doesn't matter how healthy. If you eat too much of it, you will gain weight. The next thing, when it comes to food quality, I don't really believe in removing macronutrients of, oh, I took out carbs, oh, I took out fat, oh, I'm taking out protein. And if you choose to, I'll touch upon that, but I do believe deeply that we are omnivores. We don't need as much eat as much meat as people consume. Um, but at the end of the day, especially as a woman who has tried to go vegan because I love animals and I care about the environment, I become anemic immediately. I've worked with many different doctors. I think less meat in moderation and omnivore would be ideal. Remove the chemicals, the fake color, the fake fat, the fake flavor. That stuff's not food. So common sense with food choices is going to make a huge difference. And then should you choose to go vegan for all the reasons I just mentioned or to be paleo because you just like it. You like the people, you like the community, you identify with it. God bless. Or you want to be an omnivore. I have seen perfectly healthy individuals who subscribe to every one of those diets. And the key is following the first two rules. Don't overeat, remove chemicals from your food. And I've seen vegetarians who live off nothing but pasta, so. I eat a ton of pasta, ton, perfectly healthy. Yep. Next question, please. Hi, Jillian. Hi. I know you um, said earlier that your support system was basically um, being the health conscious person, but for the person that's really not health conscious and has a friend that is pregnant, what do they do? <laughs> how, how would you address? <laughs> the friend who's pregnant and she's not health conscious? Right. Well, you said you were more of the health conscious person in, in, in the pregnancy, but for someone who's just like normal, you know, that may not say, oh, don't do that, you know. 
Like, yeah. How would you catch those? Like things? if Heidi didn't have you in her life, <laughs> for example. She would be so happy, actually. Um, so relieved, I'm sure. Um, you know what I might say? I might handle it like this. I went to this AOL build, and I listened to Jillian Michaels, and some of the stuff she said was really interesting. And you might just want to take a look at this book. I found it fascinating. All, always coming from a place of non-judgment. And people laugh. They ask me, my friends all the time, like, do you, does she let you eat that? Does she say anything to you? And I kind of liken myself to a vampire. I do not give unsolicited advice unless you invite me in. Once you invite me in, you're fair game. But, you know, I, I don't do that unless asked. And then when asked, I try to do it in a really loving way, not, hey, dummy. Because people don't know, and they don't know for good reason. This is my job. I've been doing it since I was 17. I'm, four, I'm older. So, for, wow, you've mm. accomplished a lot in one year. Yes, I have. Yes. I mean, in my 20s, I'm just so <laughs> knowledgeable. The last question, please. Hi. I wanted to know, did you incorporate a specific diet in your children's lives? In my kids' lives? Um, someone just asked me, uh, how has it affected, how has having kids affected your approach on nutrition? And it's actually softened me a bit. And this is because I believe very strongly kids need to be kids. You can't take the kids at the birthday party and say, oh, we don't have, you know, they don't have an organic cake, you don't get any. You know, I just, so like on Halloween, right? I explained to my kids, you know, hey guys, if we want to roar like Katy Perry or we want to use the force like Luke Skywalker or we want to do nunchucks like Bruce Lee, you know, these are the foods that we must predominantly consume. So I make it aspirational for them. And then I say, look, these are the less healthy foods and let's try to get the ice cream that's organic or the Justin's organic peanut butter cup instead of the non-organic. And they get a treat every day unless they do something insane like my son does pretty much on a daily basis, which is a different story. <laughs> Um, but uh, on Halloween, for example, we went out and I was like, go crazy, make yourself sick, yeah. go bananas. And then the next day, we did the switch witch. And I said, all right, guys, this is our option. The switch witch works with the fairy. They think there are fairies living behind the house, long story. Um, but I, and they buy it, which is great. So I was like, the switch witch works with the fairies. And we read them the whole poem and we said, you can trade all of this candy for a present or cash. And they, so they both said they wanted to do it. And we got my son a little Razor scooter. My, my daughter, smart, wanted cash. <laughs> <laughs> Girls always smarter. Razor, right, yeah. So, um, and so, it, and, they, and I think they knew. They were like, we don't need all this, Mom. We're cool. And so there you go. And I think it's just taking a more balanced approach with them, educating them, teaching them, involving them, and trying to make sure that, 80% of the stuff they eat's better for them. When you can get them the kid foods, try to go organic with the kid foods. And, you know, if they go to a birthday party, let them have the cake. I love it. And the book is out? Yes, the book is out today. Today, online, everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you so much, Jillian. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, guys.